Now, I've shaken one of our deepest beliefs. I think, therefore, I am, okay? I've shaken my, my lifelong belief that the voice was me. So then that leaves you with the question, if I'm not my, my voice, then who am I? Okay? Now, if there is anything controversial about what we're going to talk about today, this is going to be the most controversial uh, topic. So don't throw donuts at me. Okay? Right. We call that the illusion of self. And in the illusion of self, uh, this probably is the most complex illusion we've grown up with. Okay? I, you know, it's split into three layers, in my view, the illusion of the physical self, the ego, and our place in the world. Okay? To be able to see through the illusion of self, you have to sort of, you know, the Russian dolls, where you open one and there is another inside it, and you open another and there is another inside it, and, right? We're going to have to peel those one by one. Okay? We have, we're going to have to take one illusion that you think is who you are, then peel it, and then find another one. Now you think that this is you, we're going to peel that, and then, and so on. Okay, so bear with me a little bit. The way to do this, unfortunately, is not going to be able, is not going to be to answer the question of who are you. It's going to be to answer the question of who are you not. Are you with me with that? Okay, so if, if we can take some of our common beliefs about who we are, and convince you that that is actually not you, you will end up thinking, okay, if that is not me, and that is not me, and that is not me, then what's left is me. Fair? So I'll start with the illusion of the physical form. And the illusion is basically that you are not your body. Now, that is a tough one, because some of us are spiritual, some of us are not, some of us are religious, some of us are, some of us are not. Okay, but uh, so let's not take that from the point of view of spirituality or the point of view of, um, of religion or whatever. I'm not going to use the brand name soul or whatever. Okay, but I'm going to ask you to go back to that whole idea of the tests of perception and the test of permanence. Okay, <laughs> the test of per perception says you, if you can observe something, then that thing is not you. Can you observe your body? Subject and object, okay? It's actually quite simple, but let's take it a step further. Let's, permanence actually exposes a lot of things. If this is you, who were you when you were six years old? It was a totally different body. You realize that? It was a totally different body in the way it looked. Every one of the trillions of cells in it actually changed. Do, do you know that? So, so your, your, your red blood cells die every four months. Okay? Your white blood cells last three weeks. Sorry, last a year. Okay? Your skin cells last three weeks. Your colon cells last four days. They actually are completely replaced every four days. Every cell in that body of the six-year-old, perhaps other than a few, body, a few cells in your brain, has been replaced. It's not even you at all. Okay? From a physical form point of view, this is a completely different machine. If that was you, then who is this? Okay? Let's take it a step further. When you cut your nails, are those little pieces of you? If you're a war veteran and you lost an arm, is that less of you? If you gain 15 pounds, did we just make more you? If you get a kidney transplant, does this, is, that, is this part of you and part of the donor? Think through those. Okay? Don't think about, if I'm not my body, then who am I? Okay? Just think about if all of those changes happen to my body and I still am who I am. I mean, some of the, the older people in the room will, will relate very much to what I'm about to say. We look in the mirror and we say, is that really me? I don't even recognize this. I still feel the same way. I still feel the same person that I have always been. But that physical form is, is that really me? When I, Michael will remember, Michael, my agent is here, who's the best agent on the face of the planet and my best friend. Um, um, when we presented uh, to my, my book to the publishers, one of the publishers insisted and said, you're going to have to read the audio book yourself, okay? And I said, but I sound like a little girl. And everyone in the room laughed, because actually my perception of my voice was the, the voice of a little girl. I mean that, very true. Okay? I never thought of myself as having a deep voice. 
After that conversation, only one year ago, I realized I have a deep voice. Hey, seriously, that is how disconnected you can be from your physical form. Okay? I'm going to leave you a minute to think through this. Objections? Not yet. Now, let's take this a step further, okay? You may not be your mind, I don't know the words, you're not the voice in your head, okay? And you're not your body, okay? You're not the taxi that, or the bike that you took to the event in the morning, you're not the chair that you're sitting on, you're not this room, you're not me, you're not the person next to you. You understand all of this? Okay? You're nothing that you've ever observed. You understand all of this? Okay? Anything that you've ever observed is not you. Now, please remember, I'm an ex-executive. I'm a very realistic scientific person, and we're venturing into the uh, spiritual here. Okay? So bear with me, please. You're nothing that you've ever observed in the physical world. So then who are you? Comments? Okay. I think you are the observer, right? And unfortunately, and I know this is going to sound super disappointing, I unfortunately, I cannot describe that to you. I, I cannot tell you what that observer is, okay? I can just tell you what that ob observer isn't. Okay? It's not your body, it's not your car, it's not your, you know, your business card, it's not your career, it's not your brain. Okay? It's just outside all of this observing. And to tell you how to understand why is it that I cannot tell you who you are, I'm going to ask you to do a quick test. I'm going to ask you to look to the person on your right, and tell them what the ocean looks like 200 feet below the surface and 200 miles over, off the south, uh, e uh, southeast coast of New York. No, no, this is serious. I want you to, to, to look to the person next to you and tell them how the ocean looks like there. Okay, th there are people describing this in detail. Did you hear that? Okay. Uh, did, did we get any honest answers, like anyone told anyone, I don't know? Okay, good. Uh, now do this one. Uh, please tell the person on your left what's playing on the broadcast radio waves around you right now. There, are, there is a ton of radio waves around you now. Can any of you find Nothing Else Matters by Metallica, please? <laughs> Go ahead, tell the person next to you what's playing on the radio waves. <laughs> Good. Okay, you might as well now. You might as well now tell the person next to you who the real you is. Because these are the exact problems, right? You have to understand that this machine, the physical world we navigate with this physical machine, uh, is limited by physical senses, okay? I had a friend who was born without a sense of smell, okay? And uh, at a point in time, we were passing through a place where they had just put fertilizer or whatever. It didn't smell really well, really, really good. I said, hey, Erica, you're so lucky you don't smell this. And she said, seriously? Can you tell me what a rose smells like? Can you tell me what a rose smells like? Why not? It smells like a rose, but does that mean you can experience it? Can you actually experience what a rose is by telling you it smells like a rose? No, okay? The problem is our, our senses are not made to see what's not physical, okay? And again, I, I'm avoiding religious conversations around souls and what have you. I'm just trying to tell you, if you're not your physical body, then you're something that's not physical, okay? And if you're something that's not physical, hmm, then you're not equipped to observe what the real you is. You're not equipped to use words to describe what that is, because just like the uh, uh, 200 miles uh, off the southeast coast of New York, you've never been there. You've never seen that thing. Okay? You cannot describe it because, one, you've never seen it, and two, because, you've never, uh, because you don't have the sensory equipment to sense it. Okay? Now, however, even though that is the case, that doesn't mean that the uh, 200 feet under uh, the ocean in that spot that we're talking about doesn't exist. It exists, okay? That doesn't mean that the radio waves around you don't exist. You're just unable to sense them, okay? Now, 
too philosophical, Mo. Why don't we talk about technology instead? No, it is not too philosophical because it makes a huge difference when you suddenly realize that you're not this physical machine. Okay? It makes a huge difference when I suddenly realize that what decayed was not Ali. Okay? It was the physical form of Ali. There is a huge difference when my car got stolen, okay, and my stolen car affected my physical machine. I lost money. But it didn't affect me in any way. I'm still exactly the same. Without the thought of being very unhappy about my car being stolen, I'm untouched, okay? I'm totally untouched. Nothing made any difference to me. I'm going to leave you with this. We're going to come back to it later in our conversation. In my philosophy, and we'll come back to this again, so I told you at the beginning, there are things where I'm going to have to ask you to make up your own mind. Okay? In my philosophy, have you seen the movie Avatar? Hands, please. Everyone, good. Right. They made a lot of money on that movie. Uh, have you seen the movie Avatar? I, you, know, you know, in the movie Avatar, uh, J Jack Solly, I think his name was, Jake Solly. Jake Solly was sitting somewhere commanding that blue avatar in another place, okay? He would tell the, and, and the avatar, surprisingly, could run, could jump, could kiss, could fall in love, could feel, okay? But Jake Solly was not affected by any of this. If the avatar had died, nothing would have happened, okay? I remind you, when you sat in that movie theater to look, to watch the movie Avatar, when you sat there, Next to you, there was this guy eating popcorn. You were really annoyed by that guy. And then there was a, you know, a cell phone that lit, and you were really annoyed. And the exit sign, remember the exit sign? And then the movie started. And you got pulled into the movie, right? You ignored everything around you. You didn't feel anything at all. You were just totally tuned into that experience. You couldn't see anything else. Very similar to the experience that the real you has, when you're submerged in that physical body. You're, when you're in that physical body, you're just tuned into the movie. You're actually, it's even better than a movie, it's a video game, right? You can command it, you can change things, you interact, you do things, right? And that body feels and loves and hates and wants, okay? But it's not you. Big, big, big topic to think about. Now, if that body is not you, why do we get upset so much when, some, when things happen to that, uh, to that body is something we need to think about. I'll leave you with this and then uh, go take you to the second layer of the illusion. Now, it's going to get easier from here. Sorry about the philosophical conversation. Right. Uh, the ego. Uh, we had, when we, talk, when we spoke about why we get unhappy, we get things like, we got answers like, uh, because of peer pressure, because of other people's expectations, because, right? There is no better word in the English language to describe what I'm going to talk about, but the word ego is not accurate, okay? The ego here is to describe what I call your uh, self-perception, your, ima your image of yourself and the image you want to portray to others, okay? It is not vanity, it is not arrogance, okay? It's not really ego. Uh, it's maybe your persona, I, I, I think that could be a close English word, but let's just call it the ego, okay? Again, Eckhart Tolle calls it the ego. So take a step back and think about how that ego developed. And again, I'm not a scientist, so I'm just going to tell you a story, right? You are born, you're, you're lying there on your back, something moves by, you look at it, you're very happy. Something else moves by, you look at it, you're very happy. They give you a little shaker, you shake it, and then it falls to the ground. So what? Another shaker, right? And you're, you're, everything's okay. You're smiling, you're happy, nothing is going wrong. Then, you know, mommy comes to you, she talks to you, she says, hey baby, this is a toy, hey baby, this is milk. Hey, baby, this is this. Hey, baby, this is that. Your brain starts to say, hmm, I can do something with this. A few months later, you start to say the magic word, and you say, mama, right? And mommy runs, jumps up and down, calls daddy on the telephone, and says, he spoke. He said, mommy, I love him, you know, or love her. She carries you. She hugs you. She does whatever she does, you know, mama or whoever is taking care of you. And then 
suddenly you're like, oh, that wasn't too hard. I can get a lot more of that. You start to narrate everything around you. Tet, you know, call, uh, aeroplane, anything you want, right? And you keep doing that, and every time you do that, you get a little bit more recognition, okay? And after a while, it wears out. And so, you know, you start to say, uh, you know, maybe I should do something to get more attention, okay? Uh, and then suddenly, there comes that very interesting word. You know, you refer to yourself first, you know, let's call you, I, I, I use the word pookie, okay? So, you know, let's say you're pookie, so you start to use that, you know, mama pookie hungry, mama pookie, pookie sad, mama pookie want toy, whatever, right? And then comes that interesting word, where you suddenly say, I am hungry, I, okay? I is my self-definition. For the first time, you realize what you really are. I, okay? Very quickly, you add to it me and my, okay? And then you're done. That's your self-identity, okay? You have an identity, and you're going to preserve that identity for the rest of your life. You take a couple of steps, mommy call, you know, jumps up and down and says, wow, Pookie, you're amazing. I, you know, you, I'm, I love you so much. You start to realize that doing certain things makes you accepted and happy and loved, and so you start to do more of that. You take a couple more, of, more steps, you, take, you go upstairs, and then when you don't get attention, you break a glass, right? What you want is for that identity, I, me, and my, to be recognized all the time, okay? That identity of I, me, and my starts to build into, but this is not enough. Okay, you go into, to, into your teen years, and there are rules for how that identity should look like. You know, if they tell you that smo not smoking is, at least in my generation, you know, that it was cool to smoke and, not cool, and, and lame not to smoke, you smoke, right? If they tell you, hey, who studies? Seriously, let's just go and play football, that's the cool thing, you become the football player, right? You build an identity around who you really are. As we build those identities and go through life, and especially in this stage of your life, you start to find roles that define you. I am the thinker. I am the space entrepreneur. I am the uh, um, you know, problem solver. Uh, or it gets very sophisticated. I am a French artistic art and culture lover. Uh, so you have to blabber certain words, and you have to be annoyed with everything, and you have to, you know, uh, um, um, appear culturally educated, and you have to appreciate art, and so on. Or I am the uh, pretty seductress. So you have to dress in a certain way, you have to talk in a certain way, you have to do, and it's all on TV. You can copy it, it's very easy, right? And, and you build that identity. The problem is when you start to believe that identity, okay? You start to believe that little pookie, who simply was playing with everything, is never going to be accepted unless she wears a short dress or he you know, uh, wears a suit and a tie and appears serious. There is the role of being an adult, which actually is a role that says you have to be um, grumpy and unhappy and dissatisfied with the world. There is the, wor the role of being uh, you know, uh, a democrat where you have to, to you know, follow certain rules and certain ambitions. There is the role of being a certain football fan, football team fan. Each of those roles now become your identity. You have to live with them. You have to prove them over and over and over and over. You have to constantly prove to the world that this identity is you. Okay? But there is news. Surprise, surprise, this identity is not you. You can call me vice president of X. Now, let's go again, perception and permanence. Let's talk about permanence. Was I nothing before I became vice president of X? No, I was something. Will I, when, will I be nothing if they fire me? No, I will still be something. Oh, I'm the proud owner of, I don't know, a Porsche, I don't know, 911 Turbo. Was I nothing before that? I am a mother. Were you nothing before you were, you were a mother? Okay, I am... Uh, you know, Jacqueline's boyfriend. Were you nothing before you were Jacqueline's boyfriend? What's wrong with you? None of that is you. These identities are, n none of them is the real you. 
Okay? But we fight for them so much, and then the happiness equation breaks so drastically. Because, I think I have an image of that here, uh, because you're constantly trying to get them to see, you know, to, 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 see, to see you as the mask of ego that you wear. Okay? You're constantly trying to tell everybody, I, trust me, I am the VP of X. Truly, I am that. You know, and then people look at you or look at me when I'm playing or video gaming or whatever. And they're like, seriously? You're not, right? You're not that thing. You know? Or no, no, I'm, I'm simply dressed. I, this is my, the way I, you know, I look. I am um, a careless uh, Silicon Valley executive. Seriously? Why do you dress up then when you're going out on a date or whatever, right? And, and so that mismatch in the equation between I want them to believe my mask and you know, they don't believe the mask because that's not really even me. Even worse, as a matter of fact, if, the, if they believe the mask, they believe in something that's not you. They go, well done, sophisticated art lover, but sophisticated art lover is me, it is not me, so it's well done somebody else, okay? It's not well done me. If you really want to happy, to be happy, again, I learned that from my son. My son, at a point in time, we traveled a lot, okay? And it was hard for him to make new friends. But he made it super clear that he's not gonna ever make a friend that doesn't really like him for who he really is. And so it took Ali a little longer than Aya to make friends. Aya made friends in two and a half minutes, right? And then changed them and changed them and eventually ended up with wonderful people. But Ali would stay two weeks, he doesn't mind, okay? He would go to people and say, this is who I am, okay? I love hard rock, I do, you know, I love music, I'm not very athletic, I do this, I do that, this is who I am. If you like me as I am, you're go we're gonna be best friends. If you don't, why the pain, right? And he eventually ended up with a group of friends that were totally his type. He was the happiest person ever. They loved him dearly for who he is. And he never had to hide. He never had to change his hard rock t-shirt. He never had to change his, his jeans to appear anything for anybody. Okay? He was, I am me, and I'm surrounded by people who love me for who I am. Okay? So that mask of ego, the constant struggle, is something that if you remove, you become a lot happier. So I'm sorry for the bit of an explicit uh, um, exercise we're going to do here. You don't have to do this physically, okay? <laughs> Let's just be very clear here. Even though I do actually recommend that you do that once in your room uh, and think about it that way, okay? So let's shed off those masks of ego. I'm going to ask you to, if you don't mind, close your eyes, okay? Just be in the moment. And I want you to think about everything you own, okay? I want you to imagine that you got back home and you uh, are standing in front of the mirror and you uh, start looking at your possessions, okay? I want you to imagine that you look at your keys, for example, if you own a car, and ask yourself, did you buy that car for the utility of it? For four wheels that take you from point A to point B, or did you buy it because it reflects a certain image around you? If you did not want to reflect a certain image around you, would you have bought a different car? Would you have, bought, would you have stayed in a different place if you, did, if you didn't want that to reflect a certain image around you? Look at your T-shirt, your jeans, your dress, and ask yourself, if I did not really want to reflect a certain image about me, would, have, would I have bought a slightly bigger jeans, more comfortable jeans, right? Ask yourself, if, I, if this color was not the you know, fashion of this uh, season, would I actually buy, wear a different color? Take, th the thing is, if you find that something you own is not there for, only for its utility, then undress, take it off. It's part of your ego, okay? Think about all the accessories we wear. Do we wear them because they are there for their utility, or do we wear them because they are there to reflect a certain image around us. You know, those smart watches, crappy. They don't really work at all. Do we wear them because they are functional or do we wear them to say we're cool? You know, those fitness bands, 
Did we buy the expensive one that has the heart rate monitor that we never use? Or did we buy one that basically does the function and count the, the steps? Look at your earrings, look at your haircut, look at all of that. While you can't get rid of them, the reality is that they are there because you want to serve a certain ego. You want to serve a certain image of yourself. If you go through that exercise, open your eyes now. Uh, if, you go, if you go through that exercise alone, you will realize that 90% of the decisions that you make are not for their utility, they are to reflect a certain image of yourself. Please. Absolutely. Beautiful. So the truth is, I wear branded t-shirts all the time. Okay? I, uh, I think it's valuable real estate. You can say a message on it. Okay? And I will continue to do that. But I will not lie to myself. It's part of my ego. It's part of my ego to tell the world hmm, that I like Pink Floyd. That's my identity. Right? It's, it's okay to love something because it looks pretty, right? But looking pretty, uh, uh, you know, are, are you wearing it because, you wa because it looks pretty, even though you don't really see it? Or are you wearing it because you want to tell the world, I look pretty? Are you wearing it because you want to tell the world that I have a taste in art? I chose a beautiful earring. I struggled for a while after my son died with getting his tattoo. He had a very uh, important tattoo to me. And I struggled for a while, asking myself if I should get his tattoo. And the struggle for me was, if it meant so much to me, why do I need it in a tattoo? Do I, am I really getting the tattoo, like they say on LA, LA Inc., you know, because it means so much to me, I wanted to cherish it forever? Or am I getting it to tell the world, hey, I got my son's tattoo. I love my son so much that I got his tattoo. Okay. And the, the real, and, and by the way, just like we did with OD and OD square, hmm, there is nothing wrong with. No one will ever live without ego. Every one of us has an ego. Every one of us has to <coughs> express themselves in a way that is your identity in front of the world. Just recognize it, because you don't have to be protective of it. You have to understand that you are the same without it. Enjoy it. Okay? But don't let it make you fight for it all the time. Okay? Be beautiful, wear earrings, you know, wear fashion, but don't let it become your target. Don't let it become your way of being happy in life is for people to actually look at it and say, hey, your earrings look beautiful. Because if they don't, you'll feel unhappy. You understand? I do. I'm sorry. Mm. Yeah. They, did, did they tell you that? Did they tell did they tell you that? Did they tell you that? Because I drove a lot of fast cars. They're crappy. Okay? Seriously. I mean, the idea is if you want to drive a fast car. So let me ask you this. I, I had a, a Ferrari 599 at, the, at a point in time. That car is capable of going 320 kilometers an hour. I'm sorry, I don't know the miles. The fastest I ever driv it, driven it was 120. Just like a Honda Civic. Okay? Uh, I never cornered it around the corner uh, because it wasn't allowed to corner it around the corner. And when I came to speed bumps, it was horrible, really horrible. Okay? When I needed to drive fast, I would have gone to a racetrack where it's the only place allowed, and I would drive there. Why did I own a 599? Because I wanted to tell the world I made it. Okay? Because it was cool to own, to own a 599, and because I was going through my middle age crisis, and it was really cool when the girls looked. Okay? I'm not lying about this. I'm okay to have that ego. People who really drive fast cars, okay, they drive them not just because they're fast, because as a matter of fact, they don't drive them fast. Okay? They drive them because they, it gives them that nice little image of, I have a fast car. I'm a fast car mentality. I'm a fast person. I'm competitive. I can, right? Now, I'm not saying everyone's like that, but I'm, telling, I'm, I'm guessing that anyone who's driving a fast car around Stanford is not driving very fast. Okay? So, once again, there's nothing wrong with knowing that we have egos. 
nothing wrong with trying to tell the world. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the truth. Huh? I started to buy expensive cars way before I was rich, okay? Because I wanted to tell the world that I was rich. While I wasn't, that was my ego lying, okay? When I became really rich, what was the point in proving that I was rich? I didn't feel the urge to tell anybody that I'm rich through my fast cars anymore, okay? It's really an interesting thing in our brain to do what we want, but just don't surrender to the pain of ego, okay? The pain of ego is, I want to prove to the world that I am young, athletic, and, you know, and successful, and so if, if I'm going to buy a, fa a fast car, but I'm not young, I'm not athletic, yeah, I may be successful, but it doesn't matter, right? And they will always doubt that image that I'm giving. That I, I, I don't know if I answered you. I didn't. Okay, we'll talk about that offline. Yes. Parts of the South, people tend to be a lot more deeply intellectual. Uh, and there is a famous philosopher, Jiddu Krishnamurti, who has written a lot about this concept of who am I. And uh, I don't know if you have referred to it any time during your research, but he talked a very similar concept of what I'm hearing you express. But so what I observed over the years was in the South, people tend to not want to express what they have. They may be super rich, but they, they sometimes come across as very simple. They don't show off their wealth. But you cross to the North, and then you see that there's a lot more of that outwardly expression of wealth. And so, so uh, that goes back to your point about... So, so I'll, I'll, take, I'll take that comment into two depths, actually, into two layers. Layer one is people at the north trying to express their wealth is part of ego. People at the south trying to suppress their wealth is part of ego. Okay? So the ego of the... Uh, so so the, the way to be accepted in the south is to show that you're not wealthy. Okay? And so you try to assume that identity. You try to behave like the community wants you to behave, and you accordingly not... You don't, you don't behave as a wealthy person. Now, the right way to behave, to be happy, is to do what makes you happy, okay? It's not to do something that proves a certain idea, a, a identity to yourself or to others, regardless, okay? So as you rightly said, if you enjoy driving fast cars, buy a fast car, drive a fast car fast, okay? But don't drive it every day to work, because driving it every day to, uh, every day to work is trying to portray a message that is going beyond driving a fast car. Again, I think Ferrari will sue me for this. But anyway, uh, the, 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 l l n now this will take us to another, uh, another point. Egos are not always positive. Remember, ego is not about vanity. Ego is not about arrogance, okay? Ego is about a self-identity. A self-identity could be negative, and the most dangerous self-identities in the world are the negative identities, the identity of a grieving father, okay? That's an ego. I've lost my son, I have the right to appear sad so that I show the world how important my son has been to me, okay? That is a role, an ego, an identity that I need to play, okay? Another identity that I could play is, um, I, am a, um, I am the sufferer, I'm the one that, always, that the world is always against, I am the hero. I'm the one that always comes out a, 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 a triumph, you know, triumphant, even though the world keeps throwing bad things at me. Okay? Each of those identities is an identity that we try to protect. And how do you protect the identity of the hero? By making sure the world continues to throw bad things at you. Because otherwise, you cannot be the hero if the world is becoming easy. Right? And so you make the identity live by making your life more difficult, by becoming more miserable. Okay? And with those identities, as I said, you're never going to get rid of them. You're never going to get rid of them. But when you manage to get your ego to be identified, then just like you told your brain to shut the duck up, you can tell your ego, you don't really matter. Okay? You're not really me. I'm not my business card. I'm not my dress code. I'm not my car. I'm not my wealth. I'm not my success, and so on. As Sting will always say, right? In Englishman in New York, be yourself no matter what they say, okay? 
So uh, Ali and Aya's wise mother, Nibel, always, as young children, told them, be yourself, no matter what they say. Okay, I'm moving fast because now is lunchtime, so we will have the uh, last illusion, which is a very interesting illusion, your place in the world. I don't remember the last slide, so I'm going to ask you to, if you don't mind, um, oh, I think there was a, uh, an, uh, an exercise here, the movie, yeah. Think of a significant event that happened in your life, uh, maybe in the last few weeks, and list all of the people that contributed to that event happening. Okay? Can you do that? So you're going to say, uh, you know, I, I can see a married couple here saying, we got married, all of the people that contributed to, the, to making this happen were, you know, the people that showed up in the wedding, the people that did this, her father gave us this, my father gave us that. One minute. So quickly the event, but mainly focus on the people that contributed to make it happen. Okay? Ready? Aren't you grateful for all those people? Like they showed up, they made a difference, they were super valuable supporting actors in your movie? Right? I mean, look at the person next to you, right? You're, you're here, you're having this interesting conversation about things that make you happy. Isn't it nice to have that memory that this supporting actor is sitting right next to you while you're living your movie or finding your happiness? Now ask yourself, what does the supporting actor think? Because he's thinking, it's nice of you as a supporting actor to show up in my movie. One of you is wrong. You understand that? So I'm going to say this again. Every one of us has a pair of eyes through which we experience the world as our movie. Okay? We look at people around us, we look at creatures around us, we look at food that we eat, we look at everything as supporting actors in our movie. Okay? It's nice of that cow to die for me so that I can have my steak. Now think about the movie of the cow. Okay? For you, hmm, she, it was an, a supporting actor in your movie, you were a serious actor in hers. Okay? Now, this gets really, really complex. Because we tend to look at the world as if it's our movie, and everyone else is there for my movie, and what a movie that is. Okay? So I get stuck in traffic, or I, get, I walk into a safe way at 6 p.m., and it's super crowded. And I'm like, why are those people in my movie? You know, my movie should be easier than this. Why is the world against me, right? What's wrong with this world? This is my movie, right? As if the Big Bang happened, and then billions of years later, Earth happened, and, you know, roads happened, and Safeway happened, and then, you know, suddenly the universe decided to rush everyone there to Safeway at, six, at two minutes to six so that they show up and annoy me, okay? This is how important I am. Now, I have news for you. If you're the main actor of the movie, then the person next to you is a supporting actor, but he thinks that he's the main actor of the movie, okay? And you're the supporting actor. So, mathematically, if you are the main actor in one movie, but the supporting actor in seven billion other movies of humans, and trillions and trillions and trillions of other movies of creatures, including ants and cows and fish and everything that we eat. Okay? How much of a main actor does that make you? Seriously. Okay? The world is not revolving around you. That's a huge illusion. Okay? The world is ticking with millions, no, trillions and trillions of interconnected movies, of which your movie is one. It's, if you look at it, it looks that way. Okay? Your movie is just one of trillions of movies. Okay? And I have news for you, you're not the star of any movie. And I know that's bad news. Right? But it just gets you to the reality of the illusion. The reality of the illusion is that the world ticks. 
Okay? We're going to talk after lunch about some of the main illusions as the world ticks. The illusions of control and the illusions of knowledge and the illusion of good and bad. Okay? The world does not stop for you. It does not change direction for you. I'm sorry to say this, and I know it's going to sound rude. It doesn't even care about you. Okay? You're not that important. You're but a speck out of seven billion other specks on a planet that is a speck in a galaxy that is a speck in a universe that is endless. Okay? Oh, piece of paper. Surprisingly, actually, that reminds me exactly of Forrest Gump. Have you seen Forrest Gump? Yeah? The feather going everywhere. That's exactly what we are. Hmm? The movie just goes on. All you can do about that movie is recognize and enjoy the movie. Okay? I remember, I don't know if you've, uh, maybe it was my generation, there was a movie called Crash. Okay? Have you seen that? Yeah. So that was the story of, you know, different characters coming from every side of LA. I think it was in LA. And as they literally crash into an accident. Okay? Please, if you haven't watched it, watch it. And ask yourself, who was the star of that movie? Okay? Because that movie had no star. Let's chat. Questions? Comments? Too philosophical? Too crazy? Okay, I'll repeat this in two words. Um, you're not your brain. Sorry. It's just a tool in your hands. Okay? You're not your body. It's just the avatar you navigate the physical world with. It doesn't really matter if your body is annoyed today, because it's not really you. Your ego is causing you a lot of pain. You're constantly trying to prove, just like you proved to mommy by taking your first step. You're a fully grown man or woman already, so stop trying to prove. And you're not the star of the movie. Seriously, the world is doing nothing to annoy you. Okay? It's also not doing anything to please you. It's just rolling. So we'll take a break, and we'll come back for more illusions. Um, I, I got a, a very interesting question in the break, so I probably thought, I thought it would be good to cover it with everybody before we go back to the mainstream. Um, those who are uh, more scientific, you'll be pleased to know that the next uh, section is much more scientific, so no, no more weird spirituality from the Google X guy. Um, <laughs> But we, we, there was, uh, I, I zoomed through in the archery example, I, I, I mentioned that there were three levels of winning. There was pleasure, happiness, and joy. Remember that? So number three was um, the state of escape. Number two was the state of happiness, and number one was the state of joy. And, uh, and it's really important to distinguish between those three, because in the West, uh, uh, in the advanced world, we really, really mix those up very, very clearly, very blurry. So um, pleasure is uh, the sensations felt in your body that allow you to uh, suspend your thought uh, momentarily and accordingly uh, uh, reset yourself to your default state of happy. Okay? So once your brain stops thinking, your default state by, you know, as a child was happy, so you go back to being happy. The easiest way to make your brain stop think, to, to stop think, you, you get your brain to stop thinking is, you know, give it enough stimuli. Remember when we, when we did the, um, the exercise of the stars? When you focus on something as, in, as intense as playing sports or as intense as dancing or the, you know, the sensations that you get in your body when you're working out or when you're having sex or whatever that is, those, those switch off your brain. They get the brain to focus on that sensation and accordingly stop uh, uh, thinking. That state of pleasure uh, has the, the drawback of the constant need to get more. Because the minute the sensation goes away, your brain resets to the thinking incessant thought mode and it starts to bring new thoughts that gets, get you either happy or unhappy. Okay? And accordingly, what happens is that people tend to want more of their sensation. Right? So you start first by, so, so in, in, in my definition, I call that they use it as a painkiller. So they use, uh, you know, they use pleasure as a painkiller. What does that mean? I'm unhappy, life is not making, everything, ma making a lot of sense to me, so what do I do? I go out and I work out and I dance and I say, so, 
And so, you know, I reset after a while. I'm still unhappy because I haven't solved the happiness issue. Then I increase the dose, okay? I may want to do more of that. I want to go to a, wild, a wilder party or maybe go do extreme sports so that I am on that kite surf and it's really risky and, right? And then with, with an extra dose, I manage to stop my brain again, okay? And then uh, it comes back and, um, you know, you could go even further, go to, into drugs or alcohol, just anything that numbs that brain so that I find those moments of happiness. Using pleasure as a, as a, as a painkiller is the worst way you can use pleasure. But pleasure in itself is not a bad idea at all, okay? There are two uses for pleasure that I strongly recommend. One of them is to use it as a supplement, okay? When you're feeling happy already, okay, when things are okay, it's fabulous to go work out, it's fabulous to go dance, it's fabulous to feel, you know, to have a nice meal somewhere or whatever, right? Whatever gives you pleasure makes your brain not break out of that cycle of I'm okay, right? Just Find healthy pleasures, pleasures that are good for you, good for your body, good for your health, and so on, right? Um, I actually give myself a pleasure quota, believe it or not, businessmen, right? So I, I, I measure the number of hours I listen to music every week. Music works miracles for me. I love music, right? And as long as I'm listening to enough music, hmm, uh, my brain doesn't break out of the cycle. It continues to, to, to be in a good mood. The other way you can use pleasure is to use it as a, an, what I call an emergency switch. An emergency off switch is when your brain starts to attack you really, really hard. You can just flip that switch. What do you do? You close your door, you, you, know, you, you blast the music a little loud, you dance for a couple of, uh, 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 for uh, 20 minutes, you know, girls do that, we don't, but anyway, we listen to hard rock and we bang our head or whatever that is, right? And, and, you know, and you're, you completely suspend the suffering cycle, as I call it. You suspend that thought process that's making you suffer. The reason there is not in seeking the pleasure for its own. The reason is to suspend your thinking momentarily so that you can take control and then you can walk in and go through your thinking process from a good point, not from the, um, the, you know, the, 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 the bad cycle of the bad thoughts. Okay, uh, so this is pleasure. Uh, as I, as I, as I, you know, as I said, we're not going to talk much about it, but it's important to think of pleasure as what it really is. It's a state of escape. It's not the target on its own. The states you're looking for are the state of happiness, which is, as per the happiness equation, when your brain agrees with the world. So happiness is is really, you know, it stems, it starts from the brain. It starts from your thinking. When your thinking agrees with the world, you're happy. And that takes a lot of thinking and analysis and understanding of illusions and understanding of, of defects. But truly, when you get to that stage of, uh, OK, I thought things through. I wasn't in a state of escape. And I saw things for what they really are. And I ended up being happy. The other stage, which is the winner, in my view, is that stage of joy, a state of joy, the state of joy is when you truly don't even need to go through the thinking anymore to assess the world and find out that it should make you happy, okay? It's, it, it, the, the difference between the three states, by the way, is that the state of pleasure or the state of escape has more intense emotions. So when you're dancing, you think that you're happier than when you're happy, than when you're, when you're in joy. Your joy truly is that interesting feeling of peace and calm, okay? You're not really... You know, laughing out loud anymore, hmm? but because it's continuous, that continuous peace and calm is a lot more valuable for you in terms of happiness than the spiky states of of pleasure or the less spiky but uh, still less inten more intense than joy states of happiness. Okay, we'll come we'll come back to joy. I just wanted to make make that distinction uh, that when it comes to the three stages, your main target should be joy. And by the way. Even when you're in joy, you can com complement that with, with spikes of pleasure, and then you don't lose anything. So, so the target is to achieve joy, and then, yeah, go watch a comedy and laugh out loud, go out dancing, there is nothing to prevent you from doing that. But don't make those the, uh, the target of what you do. Sorry. Uh, I was just thinking about kind of Csikszentmihalyi's idea of flow, 
Um, do you link that in the pleasure side of things? Yes. So flow, flow is the state. Flow is a bit of a, a, is a famous state when you're so into what you're doing that you don't think anymore. Okay. Uh, I, I, I put it in the pleasure uh, state because in reality, happiness happens when you actually go through the thinking and then decide that things are okay. When you're in flow, you're not really thinking. You're just so into what you're doing. You know, this is the state where artists would get, or you know, musicians, or athletes, or whatever. Uh, it might not be physical engagement, but you're just not thinking about issues anymore. You're just flowing with what you're doing. Uh, can you ex elaborate on the pleasure quota idea? Like, were you saying you use your music to stay in the state of joy um, because you need to hit that quota? of pleasure? I have, I have lots of pleasure quotas in my life. I, I have my cup of coffee every morning. I have it in a quiet place. I have it with an audio book. Uh, I have uh, one and a half hours of work out every day. I have my music, uh, you know. Um, I actually, I, I actively work on music, huh? So I don't play music. You will rarely ever see me playing music in the background just to distract myself, okay? I actually actively listen to music. It's like my music hour. Okay? I'm going to look for certain songs, I'm going to look for the lyrics, I'm going to really enjoy the experience, I'm going to remember the memories. You know? And, and the, the whole idea is I am actively trying to, again, uh, you know, I'm solving for happy. So I'm actively trying to make sure that I'm in a good mood by doing that. And you can have as many of those as, as matches you. Okay? Uh, don't, don't, you know, the, the, the trick is that we shouldn't go to the... Um, to the pleasures that are, okay, I'm gonna go out for a few drinks with my friend. Of course, that's your freedom to do this, but those do not, are, in my view, are not healthy pleasures because at the end of it, they will stop, and when they stop, they have adverse impacts on you. You, come out, you, you, you may wake up with a headache the next morning or whatever. So I avoid the ones that give you a bit of momentary uh, uplift and then follow with a, a bad side to it. Okay. By the way, guys, I, I, in my language, I sometimes say don't do this or you shouldn't do that. I don't mean it that way. It's actually the way I speak to myself. You can do what you want. I don't mean it in, in, uh, in, a, in a, you know, like a preachy way.